Welcome everyone. My name is Deb McDonald and I'm the Regional Resource Director for California, Texas, and three counties in Pennsylvania, which include Lehigh, Northampton, and Schuylkill. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on the topic, Understanding the Role of Shame, Blame, and Trauma in Treating Mental Health Disorders. As a reminder, we will be conducting this session in webinar, webinar format, meaning all participant microphones will be muted. We will not be able to see or hear you. During the presentation, please utilize the Q&A feature to ask any questions. If we are unable to get to your question before the end of the hour, we will have someone from our team follow up with you directly. Additionally, the slides and recording of the webinar will be emailed to you in, within 15 business days of the program. Today's presentation is eligible for one continuing education credit. We would like to thank our educational partner, CE Learning Systems, for assistance in providing these credits through co-sponsorship with the American Psychological Association. Please note that in order to receive your credits, you will need to be on for the entirety of the program and complete the post-webinar evaluation. A link will be emailed to you directly after the presentation from cego.com. After finishing the evaluation, you will have immediate access to your certificate of completion. As many of us are acutely aware, trauma has a profound impact on emotional well-being and mental health and oftentimes is the root cause of many psychological challenges. In treating individuals with trauma, it is essential to create a safe and supportive environment where they can explore and process their traumatic experiences to get them on the path of healing, resilience, and restoration. Care and Treatment Centers is proud to be a trauma-informed across our organization, from our residential treatment to our outpatient services. While trauma is addressed throughout our continuum, Karen does offer programming specific to trauma on an outpatient level. Most recently, we started an adult trauma focus group and individual therapy specific to trauma at our Philadelphia Regional Outpatient Center. Additionally, individual and group trauma focused treatment is available at Karen Outpatient Treatment Services in Wyoming, Pennsylvania, where we also just opened our outpatient mental health program. Please contact us if you'd like more information on any of our trauma services. Today, I'm proud to introduce one of the pioneers of trauma treatment at Karen and our speaker today, Dr. Ramona Roberts. Dr. Roberts is the Senior Executive Director of Regional Outpatient Services at Karen, overseeing clinical and administrative operations across our regional offices in Wyoming, Pennsylvania, Plymouth Meeting, Pennsylvania, and Atlanta, Georgia. Prior to her current role, she served as the Executive Director of Karen Outpatient Treatment Center, driving significant expansions in, expansions in clinical capacity and trauma-focused training. Dr. Roberts is, rec is a recognized specialist in trauma-focused treatment with provider status for CPT, carrying a level two certification as a clinical trauma professional and various training in other modalities, including EMDR, sensory motor, IFS, expressive art, race-related and trauma-informed sociometry and psychodrama. She has received many accolades for her contributions in the field, including most recently the Council on Chemical Abuses Betty J. McDonough Treatment Award. Dr. Roberts is also the author of the book, Making Sense of What Hasn't Made Sense, a compelling guide for trauma survivors family members, friends, and clinicians, offering insightful perspectives and practical wisdom on navigating the complexities of trauma and recovery. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Roberts. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, I want to start with a, a little uh, story that um, uh, may lower my anxiety, let's see, or um, may um, bring a smile to some of your faces. Um, I have uh, two children. My daughter um, is currently nine, but when I was writing the book, uh, she was seven years old and she hadn't gotten to see daddy, my husband, for a good week because he was sick. Um, and daddy does a lot of things at night, reads to her, sings to her. And so one night I'm putting her to bed after about a week 
and she looks really sad. And I said to her, Ava, tell me why you're sad. What's going on? And she thought about it for a moment, gave me a look and said, mommy, I'll tell you why I'm sad, but you can't try to fix it. And I kind of sat back and thought, whoa, oh my goodness, here this seven-year-old in front of me is reminding me about the power of emotions and the purpose and the function of them. Um, and here, you know, me as an adult and a psychologist, right, and a trauma provider. And I just thought it was such a great reminder. Um, and so I'll tie that in as we talk about emotions moving forward. First, though, we'll do a quick there we go. We'll do a quick distinction between PTSD and CPTSD. Just to give some perspective, uh, bringing in some statistics, about 90% of the general population has experienced a trauma in their lifetime. About 70% have experienced one of those being severe. Uh, we know that adults, if we bring in the intersection with trauma and substance use, adults that have PTSD are a little over four times uh, more likely to have a substance use diagnosis as well. And then if we flip that and we look at adults that have a substance use diagnosis, about six and a half times more likely for them to also have PTSD. If we bring that into numbers, uh, then we've got 11.2 million people in the United States alone experiencing both PTSD and substance use. PTSD renders substance use disorder clients more vulnerable to poor outcomes and negative consequences of having both PTSD and substance use disorder more than any other psychological diagnosis. And it continues to intensify over time. Right now our DSM-5 uh, characterizes uh, the PTSD as a single broad diagnosis, uh, whereas the ICD-11 proposes two sibling disorder, uh, disorders, the PTSD and CPTSD. So CPTSD complex um, was initially uh, proposed by Judith Herman in the late 90s. Back then, it was actually under the name of Disorders of Extreme Stress NOS. For those of us who are a little older in the field, we remember those NOS diagnoses, right? Um, but complex is typically associated with sustained and prolonged or multiple incidences of traumatic events, chronic or cumulative traumatic experiences, multiple events often starting in childhood. And uh, van der Kolk uh, himself also tried to get developmental trauma as a distinction as well in the DSM, uh, just hasn't happened yet. Um, but these often involve a betrayal um, uh, or a relationship that, that involves uh, a real betrayal of human connection. The CPTSD in the ICD-11 um, has the same core symptoms of their version of PTSD, but it has three additional uh, groups of symptoms. And we often refer to those as the DSOs or the disturbances in self-organization. Um, so the first one there you have is problems in affect regulation. So we're talking about irritability, anger, feeling numbed out, emotionally numb. Uh, the second one is beliefs about oneself uh, as diminished, defeated, worthless, uh, accompanied by feelings of shame, guilt, failure related to the traumatic event. And then the third one you have there is difficulties in sustaining relationships and in feeling close to others. So when we look at uh, a number of uh, the research uh, articles that are out there, the different studies, um, looking at the intersection, the overlap, the distinction between these, we see that the complex PTSD has more pathology associated with it if you look on the left-hand side of the slide. On the right-hand side, um, we have some study results. So overall, complex trauma has greater and more intensive comorbid disorders compared with PTSD. In this study in the UK around comorbidity, you can see that the first and second major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder being significantly higher for those with complex trauma. So we're often taught as clinicians in our graduate programming to have uh, unconditional positive regard for our clients. Um, sometimes it might be a little helpful to tease that apart and see it as offering unconditional acceptance of the client, not necessarily the symptoms. I think it may make um, clinicians uh, a little more able to wrap their head around that. 
Um, and instead of the neutral and non-directive role that we're often taught, we can take a more active role as we recognize the impact of trauma on the brain and as we learn um, how that inhibits our prefrontal cortex, right? So uh, as that is offline, as we often colloquially um, re refer to it, um, this can interfere with self-direction. So we may need to take a much more active approach in our sessions. We also wanna be careful to teach the client how to distance themselves from affect to modulate before connecting to emotion. Um, so emotions can become magnified by traumatic activation or they get neutralized by parasympathetic hypo arousal. Um, if you've heard of you know, the hyper and hypo arousal terms, oftentimes if we just put it in uh, an easy uh, analogy, the gas pedal and the brake in your car, right? The uh, sympathetic, um, activation, putting your foot on the gas and the parasympathetic, um, putting your foot on the brake. Remember that some affective expression may have been punished as a kid. So um, we grow up with certain ideas about expressing emotion. Um, clients might grow up being very affect phobic. Uh, showing anger might have actually made things worse for them in their home environment. Maybe after crying about something, uh, a parent or caregiver responded with, you know, I'll give you something to cry about. Um, and then we can see how as adults, we have folks who struggle with expressing emotion, right? Um, and, you know, as clinicians, we often want this affective expression. And, you know, think about how you hear about the cathartic release and we want people to show uh, what they're feeling. Um, but we also have to keep this in mind, uh, what they were taught about what their emotions actually mean or the consequence that their emotions actually get. So psychoeducation is our best asset in trauma work. Our clients really benefit from learning the effects of trauma and normalizing the feelings and behaviors that help them survive. The real ingenious ways, the ingenious strategies that their minds and their bodies have come up with to help them survive. Um, really looking through the lens of strengths base. Um, these are resources, things working for the client's good. Um, and, and know that likely before hearing this type of education from you, their behaviors and their feelings probably uh, allowed them to feel a lot of shame. They were probably carrying a lot of shame, tremendous uh, amount um, because of the way this showed up in them. So don't be surprised if it takes some time to let this psychoeducation marinate and absorb, right? If we think about someone who came from neglect, maybe they're not eating well, they have poor sleep hygiene, um, they have um, uh, poor hygiene in general, maybe they stay in their pajamas. Um, it's very validating to be able to see them through the lens of, you know, you came from neglect as a child. It makes sense that you would neglect yourself, right? Um, so as therapists, we like to provide education to help them see the importance of many influences, right? Think of how much you might have um, spoken about exercise and good nutrition and sleep and all of those um, you know, other pieces that we bring in. For many trauma survivors, though, the body is not a priority. Even the term body uh, can be uncomfortable and can elicit um, a certain response, especially if their body, um, if we're thinking of like sexual assault experiences, molestation, if their body only mattered for someone else's pleasure, um, for someone else to discharge their tension on them, then caring for their body is not really valued. Uh, we also want to make sure that we help them see the distinction that their symptoms are that symptoms and not who they are as a whole person, right? Understanding of the trauma impact and how they can be triggered can help diminish the shame that they carry. Uh, recognizing the role of triggering really helps empower them. We see even in cognitive behavioral therapy that counselors can forget. Um, I've done it myself to, uh, to di differentiate between thoughts and feelings. And then you gotta add in some other things. Is it a body sensation? Is it an action, right? 
Um, we can oftentimes put the words, I feel, in front of a statement, um, and it may not accurately be a feeling, right? Um, so if someone says, I feel unsafe, I'd like to ask a little more around that because I'd like to know, is it a body sensation? Is it my chest is tight, my heart's racing? Is it a thought that I'm never safe, the world's a dangerous place? Is it a feeling of being frightened? Is it an action uh, where maybe I wanna hurt myself? Uh, so I think we uh, can just be mindful of separating those out. So um, tying in Ava's story here, um, emotions, uh, you know, oftentimes we hear someone talking about their positive emotions versus negative emotions. We as clinicians use those words. I myself have used those words in the past. Um, I've definitely evolved over my uh, treatment career in the language that I use as I come to understand a lot more in particular with trauma. Um, so I really like to see um, the emotions through the lens of functionality, um, that they have a purpose. Um, so fear, shame, and anger are the most common in trauma survivors. Fear, as a result of threat, alerts the body to danger, right? It's protective. It's a survival response. It's adaptive. And this is when it, we're in a situation where we may be harmed. What may be viewed as anger, a client's fight responses, let's say. Later, they may be heightened because they couldn't complete the impulse to fight, let's say, back then. Some of these emotions prompted responses to the immediate threat that were adaptive, but later they become a pervasive reaction to the anticipation of threat. Our radar detector uh, gets a little thrown off. And... I think it's also important to, to know that happiness isn't healthy to be in the driver's seat at all times, right? Um, us as clinicians can remember that, our clients can learn about that. Um, I'll show a video clip in a moment um, about that on another slide. When we try to shut off some emotions, right? Those quote unquote negatives, or I don't wanna feel anger, I don't wanna feel fear, I don't wanna feel um, you know, uh, fill in the blank. Um, we end up robbing ourselves of the ability to feel other emotions, right? We can't just like pick and choose. Um, so, and everyone at some point in life will have feelings of anxiety and sadness, even without trauma, right? So we avoidance won't work. And our suffering doesn't just it's, it's not that it comes from feeling the emotional pain itself. Oftentimes it's from our behaviors that are trying to get us to avoid it, right? It's the avoidance um, that can become um, problematic. And this is what also underlies, uh, for those of you that are familiar with acceptance and commitment therapy, it has been getting a lot more um, empirical support um, in particular with trauma. And trying to avoid and control emotional pain can actually lead one to behaviors that become more problematic in the long run. So for example, substance use. And it takes a lot of time and energy and mental resources. Emotions are gonna ebb and flow. I love this quote on the slide, although I'm not sure if it's accurate. Um, so if there's anyone who is Irish in the audience and says, well, I don't recall that quote, um, I'm, uh, I love the quote, regardless of where it came from, I'd like to start uh, internalizing it, right? And it's about, uh, instead of being, I am sad, it's sadness is on me. And so you can see the follow-up. Um, I'm not sad, it's just that sadness is on me for a while. Something else will be on me another time. And that's a good thing to recognize that our emotions are gonna ebb and flow. They're serving a purpose um, and, that'll bring us over here to what's the purpose of shame and self-blame. So shame makes things about the self, about me, right? We get robbed of our ability to be present, to be in the moment of good things when we don't believe that we deserve it. Uh, we can't enjoy what we don't think we deserve. And it's a body response that is accompanied by various cognitive schemas. So, you know, you hear how much trauma lives in the body. Um, the cognitive schemas attached to it maybe that it's not safe to be self assertive, to be happy, to have needs, to get our needs met. Um, it's a belief that something happened because I deserved it. And 
and because something is wrong with me, because I'm defective. This shows up in many survivors as a way to find control. Sometimes it's finding a way to feel in control, right? If it's my fault, then I can find out what I did wrong and find a way to prevent it the next time. Something happening by chance is a little harder for us to digest, right? It brings out a little more vulnerability, uh, leaves you more open to this idea of not being in control. Um, and then we internalize blame and self-hatred and more easily it drives us to a defensive mode, a protection mode um, to find that reason, right? To find that one thing that went, went wrong and the thing I should have done differently. I've got to make sense of it, right? And oftentimes it's making sense of something that didn't make sense. And to them, it will help them get in front of it happening, it happening again. Also, you'll see here that there's um, two different types of self-blame that we talk about. The behavior of self-blame, which is when survivors attribute the assault to their actions. And then we have the character logical, which is when their survivors are attributing it to their character. So the character logical, the latter, has stronger negative effects. And this would probably make sense if you think about it for a moment, possibly because this refers to the person's character, which is therefore more personal and difficult to change than an action, than a behavior, right? Um, and self-blame in general is found more so in instances of sexual assault. And in particular, the research shows this with women sexual assault uh, survivors, not that it's not the case um, outside of that. Um, but than any other traumatic experiences. Um, so possibly because society still implies an expectation that women can prevent it. We get into that um, with the information that comes out following someone's self-disclosure. So if we look at the characterological self-blame, this was influenced in the research by negative reactions after disclosure. Those are the comments by family members and the public and uh, jury and judges and, and political figures and you know fill in the blank. These are the comments of, well, what were they wearing? Or well, what was their past? Or why were they there in the first place? They should have known. Um, all the stuff that follows. So those negative reactions that follow the disclosure impact this characterological self-blame. And it's also related to problem drinking. This tells us that we need to make changes at the societal level, not just the individual in treatment. I can tell you though, um, for many years, I was even of the mindset that was passed on to me um, in previous uh, uh, ed educational settings that shame was irrational. Um, and instead I see it as that part that was really working for your benefit. Again, there's a functional purpose behind it. Um, when we get to this place with clients, uh, because we, we do get to this place in their healing journey with clients, um, that we wanna explore even, this will fall into like the sensory motor pieces, but how does that change how it's showing up even in your body? How does that change your posture? How does that change how you feel? Um, now understanding that that part of you kept you safe what happens inside you now as you take in that information? So if we take a little uh, bit of time here to do some cognitive uh, talk, um, if we think about Piaget and developmental, uh, childhood developmental uh, psychology, uh, as little babies coming into the world, um, he likes to look at us like we are little scientists little researchers. And I can tell you when my kids were little, um, I did have to call on this information at times. For example, when I had a kid who was in a grocery cart dropping toys on the floor, learning cause and effect. If I drop this, mommy will pick it up, right? Um, so when you look through the lens of them being little scientists, it can definitely uh, shift your reactions. Um, but we're constantly trying to make sense of our world, right? If you think about babies, they put everything in their mouths, they drop things, they shake things, they're trying to make sense of their world, make sense of their environment so they can understand it, so they can learn what they can predict, so they can find some semblance of control. 
Also, as children, we grow up uh, with the, as it's called, the just world belief that the world is just and fair, um, that people get what they deserve. Um, this has serious long-term implications um, in many different areas um, that impacts people's empathy for later experiences. Um, we we come in with this idea that good behavior is rewarded, right? And you know, um, good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people, um, and these beliefs work as long as there's no contradictory information which sometimes the contra contradictory information is there. We're just not seeing it. We have tunnel vision. There are some confirmation bias exercises, uh, exercises that I've used in individual, in groups and in classroom settings um, to help show this, how, how we need to try and take the tunnel walls and like just open them up a little bit um, because sometimes we're not seeing the contradictory information. So for example, if I said that, you know, people can't be trusted, well, you could be sure I'll rattle off a number of reasons that could support my statement that people can't be trusted. What I'm probably leaving out are some good instances where I actually was able to trust someone. Maybe it's something as simple as trusting uh, a peer in my therapy group that they, they didn't break my confidence, but I'm not gonna call out on that piece because it's contradictory to what my belief is that people can't be trusted. Um, so these are some cognitive pieces that, um, that come along with us in life. And in CPT, cognitive processing therapy, uh, we talk about how people end up with these three possibilities for integration. So the assimilation is about the past um, and the over accommodation is more about the future and even so somewhat about the present. And I'll talk about where we wanna land with accommodation in the middle. So assimilation, if I come in with beliefs that the world is fair and just, or that I'm in control of my life, then when something traumatic happens, I end up thinking I must have done something bad to deserve this because the world is fair. Remember, um, you know, this is something I did coming back to get me. Um, or I get into thinking that I could have prevented this because I have control in life. I have control over my world and environment, so I must have messed up. If I can just figure out what went wrong, then I can prevent bad things from happening in the future. And what other people say also doesn't help this. It can solidify this belief. Again, if we go back to those types of questions of what were you wearing, uh, what were you doing there, um, that's you know solidifying that if only I had just done this differently then this wouldn't have happened the same way. So uh, if you were not alone during the event, if you had someone else there to blame besides the actual perpetrator, you might blame someone nearby who didn't actually cause the event or intend harm. Um, in the military, for example, it's often taught that if you do your job well, people come home. So if lives are lost, the thinking goes back to what did I do wrong or what did my commander do wrong? Um, and in cases where, you know, maybe you've had an explosion that you had no intel on, um, you know, and you couldn't possibly know what was going to happen. Um, you might also blame your, again, commander um, be because there's, you got to try and find a way to see that your side still has control, even if it's that your side had control and messed up. Uh, maybe a kid who was abused by one parent blames the other parent, uh, even if they didn't know about it. And if I come in with beliefs already that I'm a bad person or that I don't have control over my life, let's shift those beliefs a little bit, um, then the traumatic event that happens may act to co-sign that. So see, um, I deserved it, or it just proves that I have no control. The over-accommodation piece you know, is, are things like, I used to think the world was safe, but this trauma has taught me that I'm wrong. It's totally unsafe. The world is a dangerous place. I can't date. If I date, it'll happen again. Um, on the over accommodation pieces, I would caution anyone to not spend too much time in therapy on this if you haven't resolved the assimilated beliefs. Because remember, there are distorted beliefs about why the trauma happened, the self-blame. Um, that's the basis for their PTSD symptoms and their over-accommodation. So you can't work ahead of that. 
Um, you know, I used to trust my judgment and decision making, but now I can't make decisions. I must control everyone around me. I've got to be on guard at all times. Um, uh, and, and they may use categories um, that the trauma falls into. So maybe it's, I'll stay away from all men. Um, sometimes an over-accommodated thought uncovers your assimilated one. So someone might say parking lots are dangerous. Um, and I might ask, you know, how did you come to the belief that parking lots are dangerous? And then I end up hearing, well, I should have known better um, than to be there at night. It was my fault that I was in that parking lot at night. For accommodation in the middle, this is really learning the more realistic and reasonable um, information that bad things do happen to good people, that good people have done bad things, um, that I have power and control over many things, but not all. So, you know, I don't control the weather, but I do control if I, you know, want to bring an umbrella or rain boots or snow boots. Um, another piece, though, is learning the realistic um, piece that a different action might have had a worse outcome. So this is where we hear that hindsight bias, if this, then. Well, if this, maybe it's if I had fought harder. So if I'm telling myself and telling other people, if I had just fought harder, it would have been different. I would have gotten away. But maybe if I had fought harder, I would have ended up dead in a worse situation, right? Because again, the contradictory pieces that I'm not seeing is maybe the person had a weapon. Uh, maybe there was some other piece to the puzzle that I'm not factoring in, right? In cognitive work, we also talk about natural versus manufactured emotions, where natural come directly from the event with what would be typically expected. For example, if you had a loss of someone, you would probably expect sadness if that person had a fond relationship with them. Um, and manufactured come from the narrative that gets created. So it was my fault. I shouldn't have done that and so on. Um, but I do want to sidebar for a minute with this slide to talk about shame as it relates to moral injury. And I know this has actually been getting a lot more attention in the last couple of years, um, and I think for good reason. We want to be sure that we ask about self-blame and things you could have or should have done differently so that we can work on separating and teasing apart from those who have misplaced blame out of a desire for predictability and control, which again leads to that hide and sight bias, with those that we need to leave room for, for someone who actually was the responsible party and now is experiencing profound guilt and, sh and shame and a dramatic change in identity. I'm a bad person, right? Um, it can show up as an inability for, to forgive oneself a loss of meaning, self-disgust. Moral injury really has to do with the emotional and psychological impact from instances where I perpetrated something that actually violates my moral compass. Um, it could be that I failed to intervene in a situation. It could be um, that maybe in combat, I engaged in atrocities. It could be that I left an abusive home, but I left siblings behind. And that meant I left them in the abuse. Um, it could be that I texted and drove my car and crashed, or I was driving under the influence and I injured another party or killed someone. So it, it ties in also for those um, in substance use, um, things that people did in their active use um, that, they, that they see goes against their moral compass, this, this kind of um, ethical violation of their own moral code. And interestingly, there have been studies showing that moral injury is more prevalent in healthcare settings than even in the military. Uh, moral injury among healthcare workers may occur if they have to make difficult decisions related to life and death triage situations or resource allocations. Um, they also had some studies during the pandemic that showed um, this moral injury around, um, you know, feeling guilty about surviving or potentially infecting other people that they cared for. Um, maybe experiencing situations where they perceive um, an unjustifiable or unfair act or policy. 
Um, they've also got some studies showing moral injury among law enforcement um, and civilians that are experiencing community violence. Vanderkolk uh, speaks of moral injury as this part of you that wants to destroy you because of how mad it is at you for what you did. Um, we can end up with this profound self-hatred, this guilt, feeling of worthlessness that I deserve to suffer. We want to meet our client's disclosure of this shame with compassion. Moral pain is actually a natural response. And Dr. Wyatt Evans, some of you might have seen his workbook. Um, he's one of the authors of the Moral Injury Workbook. Uh, recently, he said that guilt is an adaptive emotion. Uh, so it helps one make the choice to stop the behavior or to change future behavior. Um, if we stay in the cognitive piece for a moment, because we were just talking about, well, I was just talking about cognitive pieces. Um, if someone did something egregious, we're not trying to reframe or challenge the legitimacy of their appraisal. If we aren't careful, we can gloss over the fact that they indeed were involved. Um, and there can be exaggerated beliefs. Um, and if we engage the CBT tools too quickly, we can invalidate that client. Um, so again, we're not trying to challenge the appraisal that they had responsibility, but we might look at the exaggerated beliefs that come later, like I'm unforgivable, I'm unlovable, where this generalizes to. Um, we can focus on relationships, attachments, love, trust, bring in some of the third wave of CBT with acceptance and commitment therapy, as well as mindfulness. There have been some discussions in the literature about CPT, cognitive processing therapy, or prolonged exposure to help with moral injury. But the problem is that moral injury hasn't really been assessed or measured, um, which is why we don't see a lot of research talking about uh, what methods to use for it. But we definitely need to be asking the question. Uh, we need to make sure we tease out um, this from other shame that we were just talking about. So as we can see, it's not always as easy as characterizing something as natural versus manufactured. And it's important for us to look through the strengths-based lens of these symptoms being survival strategies. And Burgess um, had a study of rape survivors who blame themselves and found that those who did blame themselves actually had better outcomes. So let's try and wrap our heads around that. They blame themselves, but they have better outcomes because again, this is where we're seeing functionality, right? Because of how it develops to protect oneself from future harm and how it helps them establish a sense of power and control after an experience of not having power and control. So we have to honor that tough part, that tough part and help it take uh, care of the more vulnerable part of self. Now, some of you who have some IFS training are hearing me use the word part and you're like, oh, I'm thinking of IFS stuff chiming in here. Um, and I will give you some tidbits um, for those who aren't familiar with IFS. I will tell you it changed my whole way of being with clients. But I want to show this quick clip from Inside Out. Some of you might be completely ecstatic because the sequel is coming out in 2024. I can't wait to get my hands on it. The new part that's coming is anxiety. Um, but we're going to show you this part, um, this clip here from Inside Out, where sadness comforts bing bong. Now I wanna leave work and go watch the rest of the film. Um, so I show this clip often, um, again, to in, in groups and in individuals and in the classroom. And it you can probably see how useful it is to clients, right? It, because Joy was so afraid of the sadness um, and what it was gonna do. And this is showing you the functionality of sadness, that there's a purpose for her as well in her role. Um, I also like to use this with beginning clinicians in counseling skills classes, because I think as clinicians, we get uncomfortable when we see emotions happening in our, in our office in front of us. And we've got to know that we don't have to jump in and fix it, as my daughter said, right? That sometimes we need to allow them their experience of that emotion. There we go. Um, 
So just to give you a little bit on IFS, um, again, I think it's changed my world in doing um, trauma work. Um, in IFS, we focus on the intent, but the field focuses on the effect. When you focus on the effect of the part, for example, the problems the drinking is causing, we can indoctrinate shame um, without intention. We look at all parts being welcome and all parts having good intention. Now, the primary relationship is between the self and their parts. The therapeutic relationship is secondary. When you look on the right side of the slide and you see the goals, notice that building resources isn't one of them. That doesn't access the self. In fact, it actually builds up managers. Again, this changed my whole way of understanding and the way I practice uh, when it comes to focusing on resources. Um, so all, all parts have a role in the system and they're there to protect or hold wounds. Our exiles are gonna carry our wounds and we have two kinds of protector parts. They either prevent the wounds from getting triggered, the manager part, or they stop the pain, the firefighters. Good managers prevent bad things from happening. The prevent the pain parts run the day-to-day -day life. Um, so they, um, they caretake, they obsess, um, they want to look good, they avoid, um, uh, they want to be in control, they want to be perfect. The stop the pain parts um, react when the wound has been activated. So you could think the prevent the pain parts are working their butts off and then the stop the pain parts come in and they drink, they cut, they dissociate, they purge, they binge, they have suicidal thoughts uh, and so on. So I think it, IFS is a very non-pathological approach to parts um, and we offer parts to not have to do their job anymore. We don't try to get rid of parts. Um, we offer to heal the wound so that it no longer has to, and so it doesn't have to drink or cut anymore. So I've mentioned two treatments so far. Well, I, I mentioned a few, uh, acceptance and commitment therapy, CPT, IFS. I wanna give you a little bit of the top down versus bottom up, and I wanna make sure that we're careful, careful to not just like pick a side, you know what I mean? Because a lot of these have research su uh, supporting it. They have uh, empirical support. I also wanna be careful that we don't just look for treatments because they're evidence-based, because we have a lot of modalities in our field that haven't gotten the recognition, the status of being evidence-based only because they haven't been the focus of research or resources aren't there. Um, especially when we look at marginalized clients, there's a number of approaches that haven't been identified as evidence-based evidence -based that are useful. Um, but the top down, um, we're, we're working with the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Um, so the area of the brain that deals with logic and reason. Um, the shortcoming here is the brain's uh, um, ability to regulate arousal through cognition often gets compromised or deactivated when, again, you learn about the brain impact where it goes offline. So we're dealing with a lot of the conscious thought pieces, which is why you see cognitive behavioral therapy, CPT, mindfulness-based CBT, DBT, even psychoanalysis. The bottom up, as you can even see in the image, um, we're dealing with regulating and adjusting the visceral responses associated with complex trauma um, without needing the cognitive forethought. Um, there's also some talk about a side door approach through the medial prefrontal cortex with some neuroscience uh, focusing on the limbic system being consciously accessed through interoceptive um, awareness. So we could think of like meditation, biofeedback, expressive art, which would be you know, the side door and bottom up. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, and obviously, um, you know, you could get your own formal training in these modalities. Um, a CPT, for example, though, was even done, they did it in the Congo. There's a research study you could look up done in the Congo um, with 16 villages, even with literacy challenges, where they took psychosocial assistance and trained them in five to six days and then had successful re results having them um, utilize this approach. Um, Dr. Scott Giacomucci discusses psychodrama and experiential therapies, which on the bottom up, a number of those are experiential therapies, allowing us to go places that are impossible to get to with that traditional trauma talk. Um, so again, um, just some areas for you to do some further uh, research, further exploration. Now, even though I said resources will build up managers, some of you don't have that formal training in those modalities. 
And so what kinds of basic things can you start to um, take into your, your office? Um, be mindful that breathing and uh, breath work exercises can be triggering. Um, a deep inhale is often associated with terror. So you wanna be careful before you talk to people about taking a deep breath that can make it worse. Instead, the research supports a real heavy sigh, a large exhale. Um, we also know um, that you wanna watch the, the language around, let's use this to relax you. Well, maybe you wanna try, let's use this to find a calm and alert state because relaxed may be um, triggering because it could be used by their abusers. Um, focus concentration, not effortful thought. So like just jigsaw puzzles, solitaire, coloring, things like that. Repetitive activities are very calming, um, ironing, knitting, um, petting an animal even. Having a coping skills chart can be like a meter or checking the thermostat, but you probably wanna draw two lines. The first line of like where you're feeling. So this could be baseline on one side and then you're feeling a little stressed out to where maybe at the other end, you're feeling like you might use a razor to self-harm. The bottom meter could be your coping skill that you use at different points because coping skills, when we talk about them, sometimes we give them some of the basics, but a coping skill that they use at 2 p.m. just doesn't compare to the experience they're having at 2 a.m., right? Um, survival kits, they can even be little toolboxes where you put a bunch of things in the box. It could be their coping skills chart, a stuffed animal, um, something that has a good memory in it. But safety nets. So Janina Fisher does share the sentiment in her comment that asking, can you contract for safety is an empathic failure. If suicide is the solution, what's the problem? So we want to look at it more like surf circus acts have safety nets, right? Um, just know that our alarm will increase dysregulation instead of modulating it. We can be curious without conveying alarm about their suicidality um, and just being curious about what do you hope would happen? You know, what do you hope um, to get uh, if you die? And a lot of times what you hear is about relief. Um, so I'd love to take any questions at this time. I feel like um, we could have gone in so many different areas, but we have a very short time together. So what do we have, Deb? All right. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. We will now answer some of the questions that were submitted through both the registration process and through Q&A feature. But one big one, many asked, could you just state the name of your book again, please? Making sense of what hasn't made sense. Thank you. Okay. Again, if we don't have time to answer your question, we will follow up with you directly after the presentation. So the first one, Dr. Roberts, are there any references as far as working with immigrant survivors of trauma? So there are a number of factors to consider when working with immigration. We've got the pre-migration factors. Um, maybe there is assault, escaping political violence, gang involvement, um, and we've got post-migration factors. So we're dealing there with um, uh, fitting in in the new environment, the legal uh, uh, insecurities, the financial insecurities, uh, which have been shown to moderate mental health. And then you add in if there's a variety of ethnic and racial um, status statuses that um, that bring on discrimination with it. Um, I read a study with Hispanic youth. Um, if that is asked, I can supply it. I have it saved. Um, it was done a few years ago. They showed that our standard trauma assessments are not capturing the immigration related trauma and they significantly uh, predicted depression and PTSD. So I think we need to get better at asking the questions around immigration and be mindful that our typical assessments aren't going to catch these things. Okay, thank you. The second is, as a woman of color, I would like to learn more about the differences of how this impacts our community. Specifically, what are some best practices for treating shame in therapy? So I um, have these stats because I recently did a presentation on this as well. Um, there's a research out that shows 63% of Black people uh, believe that a mental health condition is a sign of personal weakness. 
Now, we can be looking at a number of groups in that person of color category, right, for the woman who asked the question. Uh, but I thought this was an interesting stat to, to share and that one in three black people who need mental health care receive it. It's not just stigma, um, inability to pay. Uh, we've got premature termination rates. For any of you that went to graduate school and used Sue and Sue's uh, Counseling the Culturally Diverse Books, um, it's probably the most widely used. He talks about the 50% pre-termination rate for people of color versus only 30% for white people. And that's not, um, not being understood, feeling validated, seen and heard. Um, we have to remember that counseling and therapy don't take place in a vacuum isolated from the larger socio-political climate uh, that, you know, that, uh, that we're dealing with. Um, Long-standing violence against people of color, um, even a term I hate to repeat, Black-on-Black -black crime, um, is often referenced um, in ways to displace blame. Um, but in actuality, it's a media construction, because if we look at the preponderance of violent crime, it's actually done neighbor to neighbor, but it's not presented that way. Myself and a couple colleagues, we did some research on message framing in the media, and it makes a difference. Um, but to give you some references for the um, woman asked the question, I think um, I'll name some people and um, maybe we can get these in the chat. The first one, Dr. Ken Hardy, follow his work. Um, he shares a journal article on reclaiming children and youth that our difficulty in meeting the needs of young people of color is not about resistance and anger. It's about us failing to appreciate the ways in which race is entangled with their suffering. And then they get trapped in the systems of justice, social service, treatment. Um, so check out Dr. Ken Hardy's work. Um, if we think about the ACEs study, it was a groundbreaking study, but it was mute about race and racial race related trauma. Um, if we don't have a nosology for it, we can't treat it. We don't have a name, we can't treat it. So we need to get better at identifying it. And one person who did bring us there is Dr. Monica Williams. It's Monica with two N's actually. So if you're going to look up her work, um, she actually created the very first clinical interview called the Yukon, um, the Yukon Racial and Ethnic Stress and Trauma Survey. She also created a 21 item survey, the uh, Trauma Symptoms of Discrimination Scale. Um, check that out for resources. Um, you might also hear the terms from Dr. Kent Butler, the president of ACA of Continuous Traumatic Stress Disorder, or Dr. Robert Carter of uh, Race-Based Traumatic Stress Injury, and even Resma Menachem, um, he believes that the term post and PTSD is inaccurate because people of color are experiencing this, hence Dr. Kent Butler's um, uh, title of continuous traumatic stress disorder. So um, Resma Menachem's uh, information shows how we can't trace where our symptoms come from, so we think they're personality traits in certain cultures. Um, it gets decontextualized. Um, so I think those are some great people, some resources that you can go to, look up their information, um, and really get more equipped to work with, uh, with people of color. Okay, I have one more question. What is the impact that trauma, shame, and grief have on the development of our attachment style? So my favorite stuff to talk about, um, and it's probably my favorite time being a mom, was looking at babies and toddlerhood because of all the experiments we know of. We've had, again, you can look these up on YouTube, uh, Joe Campo's visual cliff experiment for social referencing. By 10 months, they're basing their emotional reactions on their caregivers. Um, Edtronic's still face experiment to show you the impact on parental affective display on their kids. So think about a parent who's experiencing severe mental illness or depression or substance use and how that affective display impacts their children's. Harlow's monkeys, Erickson's psychosocial stages with trust, Bowlby and Ainsworth. Um, luckily, the majority of babies end up being securely attached. Um, but um, the first couple years of life, it leaves us very vulnerable for early childhood trauma to have such a big impact. All right. Well, thank you again, Dr. Roberts, for this informative presentation and to all our attendees for joining us today. There are more questions and we will have her re respond to them and we will get them to you through your regional resource director. As a reminder, this presentation is eligible for one continuing education credit. 
watch your email from cego.com with a link to complete your evaluation. I'd also like to remind you that the slides and recording of the webinar will be emailed to you within 15 business days of the program. Thank you again for all of you for joining us today. We encourage you to stay connected to Karen through our regular email updates, social media channels, and our website. Take a moment to learn about what's new at Karen, including the relaunch of our healthcare professionals program on our Pennsylvania campus last week. And also be sure to check our website at karen.org backslash webinars for upcoming continuing education opportunities. In the meantime, please reach out to your local regional resource director at any time for additional information, resources in your area, or questions regarding admission to any of Karen's program, programs. We also remind you that Karen is here for you and your clients through the holidays, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Make it a great day. Thank you.